Um, welcome. This is my my first World Veg Fest. How's it been going so far? Good. Good. You hear some other good speakers? I assume you've all heard Will Tuttle already or you wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> okay, so he's fantastic. And it looked like a good lineup, so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Carrie Zemko. I am a nurse and really I'm just a person who found out about plant-based diets several years ago and was really, really pleasantly surprised at how powerful this way of eating and living is to make us healthier and in many cases happier and to know that we're doing a really good thing for the earth and for our communities and for each other and I just think it's amazingly awesome powerful, so um, a big part of my work now is helping people access good information. So I'm hoping to do some of that for you today. And what I <laughs> accidentally did is I, I stole a presentation title from someone else, so I want to make sure and give a shout out. I feel like the next slide, James. Um, that's me on the left, and that's Dr. Michael Greger on the right. Have, how many are familiar with this work? Awesome, okay. So, so early this year, Dr. Greger did a talk called More Than an Apple a Day, Combating Common Diseases, and I guess somehow my subconscious remembered that title and really liked it because I stole it word for word before I realized that's what I'd done. So Dr. Greger's title, and his work is fantastic, I absolutely recommend you check out some of his videos. His website is nutritionfacts.org, and what he does is really interesting. He received a, a large grant from, I believe, the NIH, don't quote me on that, to summarize everything that comes out of all the English language nutrition academic journals and put those into short video clips and basically translate the research findings into layperson language and put it out there for anybody to access all for free. So it's a fantastic project. You can search the website by topic and find out more about whatever's on your mind. And then for the last, I think, three years, he's been doing these year in review videos about an hour long, um, which go over everything significant to come out of the research over the previous year. So last year, the link is down here to the one that I accidentally stole the title of, and that one, um, he took an interesting approach, which was looking at the top 15 causes of death in the United States, and kind of using that framework to summarize all the research findings that he was reporting. So I'm going to do something similar today. Um, the reason for that, of course, being that most of these diseases are preventable. So if you think about that, what we're, mm -hmm, what, we're, what we're suffering from and dying from is very largely avoidable. So to me, that sounds like a call to do something about it. <laughs> so let's get this stuff figured out and figure out how to live longer and better. We've created these diseases in ourselves, which is the sad truth. And most of the time, that's through our food. So I'm going to give you, like I said, some of the same information Dr. Greger does, but do it a little bit differently. One thing I want to point out, and I always have to be careful the exact words that I use when we're talking about this stuff, is that this phenomenon of, especially in America, people making themselves sick and dying through their food choices is partially our fault. And I say partially because I want to introduce the concept that there are powerful forces at work setting us up for failure. <laughs> so if you are somebody who has ever been confused by nutrition information, or if you've been frustrated by how hard it is to figure out which are good sources of information and which are not as good, and what a challenge that can be, I want to tell you that you are not alone. <laughs> and that is the reason why we're in such the pickle we're in. It's so hard to find good info and know what's good and what's just a fad for somebody to make money off of. Get it all sorted out and do something to make yourself healthier. So if you've ever you know, felt frustrated or had any sort of emotional reaction to any of these very, very difficult topics, please know that you are not alone and there's lots of help out there. I will be giving you lots of um, book titles and articles and other resources today, so, so get your pens ready if you'd like to write down resources. So I think we can outsmart this system that's, 
that we're all living in that's making things very difficult, and I think it's our responsibility to ourselves and our communities and the planet to do that. So let's start now. So thank you, thank you for being here, for being open to learning new things and looking at new points of view. And let's dive in. So next slide. So I want to look at worldwide, as well as just within the United States, what are these leading causes of death? And then beyond what, what Dr. Greger has done in some of his videos, I want to make sure we're clear on what those are. When I say heart disease, what is heart disease? So let's go into a little bit of the details of that, make sure we're all on the same page. I also want to look at leading causes of disability, because it's not just how we end, it's what was our life like up until that point. We're, we're looking at quality as well as quantity. Hi, welcome. <laughs> So let's look at that too. And another way to look at that is what are the most prescribed drugs in this country? Because unfortunately, pretty much healthcare is disease care is prescribed drugs. So that's another way to just look at some data and get a little bit of perspective on what's going on around here. So let's, let's run through these and try to figure out how much of all of this is really within our control. Next slide. And then while we're at it, let's play some fun games. Let's throw in a little critical analysis of our government and industry and social and healthcare and how these all impact our health. Let's try to figure out how to save the planet and solve world hunger. Let's have time left over for questions. <laughs> Go ahead. And if you're very lucky and I'm feeling good about our interaction here today, I will also share with you the thing in the world that terrifies me the most. Next slide. It's not the hamburger. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, oh, as I already said, I will be like mentioning lots of books and things, so if you want to write them down, I really, really like to make sure that people have good sources of good information because there's so much terrible information out there, so when I find something good, I want to share it. Go ahead. And let's jump in. So here we have the top 10 causes of death in the world. And this data is from 2012, and the source is the World Health Organization. So top three, we have ischemic heart disease. We'll talk about heart disease. We have stroke, which is very much related to heart disease. We have COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And then as we go down through the list, these are lower respiratory infections. We'll talk a little bit about that. This next one got cut off, but this is cancers of the tracheus, bronchus, and lungs. Then we finally get down to something infectious. And again, these are world statistics. So we didn't get to infections until number six with HIV AIDS, also with diarrheal diseases. That would be um, basically water sanitation issues for the large proportion of it, things like hep A and E, hepatitis A and E. Then down at number eight, we have diabetes, only killing 1.5 million people annually worldwide, which kind of clues us in 1.5 million out of 7 billion, not that all 7 billion are dying every year, I think it's more like 46 million dying every year, but that gives you a clue that that might be a little bit different proportionally worldwide than it is within the United States. Then we have road injuries, car crashes, and hypertensive crises, which of course relate to the top stuff with heart disease. So next slide. Ischemic heart disease is number one, number one killer worldwide. What is it? So ischemia means tissue death. So this is also called myocardial infarction or heart attack for the, for the um, majority of everything that falls under ischemic heart disease. Basically, <coughs> tissue death within the heart that leads to a person's death. What causes heart attacks? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Clogged arteries. Sorry? Clogged arteries. Clogged arteries and diet. Yep, you're right on the money. So does that sound like something potentially preventable? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's just run through some terms. Atherosclerosis, the sclerosis part is um, narrowing. So this is also, and hardening. So this is also sometimes called hardening of the arteries. And what I want you to take away from this is that this is a disease process that happens throughout the body. So if it's happening in the coronary arteries, those two main arteries at the top of the heart that go like this and make a crown shape, so they're called coronary. If it's happening there, it's happening everywhere in the body. It wouldn't just happen 
in one isolated place. So when it happens in the arteries of the heart, and people have um, bypass surgery or some other specific treatment for that, that's called coronary artery disease. And coronary artery disease then, I'm giving it away, is the number one killer of Americans as well as worldwide. So big, 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 big killer. Most of these deaths are from heart attacks, which are caused by a sudden blood clot or a more sudden obstruction in the artery. You hear about things being a certain percentage occluded, and if all of a sudden that last little bit of blood flow gets cut off, oftentimes because of a clot, there you go, heart attack, tissue death. And unfortunately, for about 30% of people who have um, coronary artery disease, sudden death is their first indication that they have the disease. So unfortunately, lots and lots of people are walking around with this disease process going on in their bodies, maybe a little bit in denial, maybe just truly unaware, and unfortunately for a big portion of them, suddenly dying is their first clue. Very sad. Next slide. Did I hit the right one? There you go, you're good, good, thank you. <laughs> I probably missed it. So ischemic heart disease, um, atherosclerosis, like I said, that's the term for when it's happening anywhere in the body, not just in the heart. This creates life-threatening blockages, often without any symptoms, which is scary. So how does this happen? Fat in the diet. The plaques are made of fat and cholesterol. So yes, those lab values are relevant when you have your cholesterol and triglycerides checked and they indicate an unhealthy diet. So yes, there are some people who are genetically dealt very, very poor cards who will have very high cholesterol, but it's not as many people as we think. It's a very, very, very small percentage of people with high cholesterol and these clogged arteries who actually have a real genetic component to that going on. Familiar hypercholesterolemia is a very, very small fraction of everybody with atherosclerosis. So just to be clear on the categories, things like arrhythmias, rhythm problems in the heart, or infection, pericarditis, these would also be lumped under heart disease, but the vast majority of all heart disease would be this atherosclerotic process, which is related to food. So there's a concept, um, how many people are familiar with Dr. Neil Bernard and his work, awesome. So Dr. Bernard is the um, founder and president of Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And this is a phrase he uses frequently when talking about heart disease, the canary in the coal mine. So does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's a different, different condition, which a lot of men suffer from which is considered a symptom of the same atherosclerotic process, which could manifest as heart disease. But for a lot of men, the first way that it manifests is in erectile dysfunction. So that's a clue that if things aren't working, you may want to take a look at the, the fat and diet. Okay, let's move on to number two. So how many have seen these pictures before? A couple people. So, Putting this information into, into practice, looking at, at relevant research with this information, two doctors definitely stand out. So Dr. Dean Ornish, who is pretty local, first showed in the 90s, and then Caldwell Esselstyn out of Ohio also clearly demonstrated in his research that the um, blockages in the coronary arteries can actually be slowed down, which we used to think was impossible, but once you have that process going on, inevitably it would continue and continue and possibly cause death. Not only could that process be slowed down, it could actually be reversed. So this was major, major headlining news when, when this research came out. Um, and it's, it's something that offers a lot of hope. I think this is exciting. You know, we can stop our diseases and actually turn them around if we learn how to do so. So we'll talk more about their Actually, I'll do it now. Let me tell you a little bit more detail about Dr. Esselstyn's, Esselstyn's study. <coughs> so, let's see, this started in 1985. He started a study with 24 patients, and he's affiliated with the uh, Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. And collectively, these 24 patients,
patients have experienced 49 cardiovascular events, so heart attacks, strokes, etc., um, during the previous eight years only. So again, 24 patients, and of those, there were 15 cases of angina, chest pain, 13 cases of measurable disease progression, so where they've been going to a doctor, having the angiograms for a while, and you could see the arteries getting narrower, so the disease was progressing. There were seven bypass surgeries, four heart attacks, three strokes, two angioplasties, and two worsening stress tests. And five of these patients were told by their doctors that they should not expect to live out the year. So these are very, very, very sick people. And what Dr. Esselstyn did was he sat them down, had a very, very serious talk with them about their food choices, and taught them a completely plant-based or vegan, oil-free way of eating, and actually gave them tons of support and resources and references, followed up with them regularly, really stayed on their case to get them to change their diet in this way, and they had amazing, amazing results. So their, uh, their cholesterol on average went down from 246 to under 150, big change. Their follow-up angiograms showed that the disease progression had not only been stopped, some patients had actually experienced reversal of the disease, arteries opening back up. Their chest pain was improved for, I, I believe, everybody, and in many cases, completely gone. And then their capacity for exercise increased. I find this one interesting because exercise was not part of the prescription. The only thing they were specifically asked to do was this very, very intensive dietary change. Um, and sexual function was restored because once the blood is flowing better in one place, it's flowing better everywhere. So six patients couldn't do it. Out of those 24, six would not change their eating to the extent that Dr. Esselstyn wanted. And of those six who dropped out of the study, four of them had increased angina, chest pain. Four of them had bypass surgeries. There was one angioplasty, a stent, one case of congestive heart failure, and one death. So you can see clearly that the patients who, who stuck to it, who were compliant, for lack of a better word, with the diet change, they took no additional drugs, they had no more surgeries. None of them did. And only one of those 18 patients actually had a bit of a decline in health. He was the one who was intermittently compliant. So sometimes he was doing what he was supposed to, sometimes he wasn't with the food. So pretty, pretty powerful results. In statistics or in analyzing clinical research, we talk a lot about very, very small differences relatively in outcomes. You don't need a statistician to figure this one out. Of the 18 who were compliant, they all did better, except for one. Um, and then of the six who were non-compliant, they had terrible, terrible outcomes. So this is pretty black and white stuff. Um, let's move on, next slide. So these are the, the two books by these two physicians that I wanna make sure everybody is familiar with these titles. So Dr. Ornish's book is called Dr. Dean Ornish's Program for Reversing Heart Disease. And Dr. Esselstyn's is Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. Both excellent books, very easy to read and understand, good information, good sources. And of course, they each have a website as well, some helpful stuff. Next slide. Sorry, do you know if these are available outside? I don't know. I have a feeling they might be, but okay. sorry, I don't know. Okay, so let's jump to the number two leading cause of death, strokes. So this is a somewhat similar related process to atherosclerosis. So this is when a plaque in an artery, we were talking about those plaques that are pretty much made up of fat and cholesterol, also some white blood cells, when one of those ruptures, and it either causes bleeding or it may cause an area of the brain to experience some tissue death, which would be a cerebral infarction. These are also called a transient ischemic attack. And there are, I'm not even gonna bother to come up with some specific ones. There are countless, countless resources, scientific studies linking stroke to a fatty diet. So let me just go ahead into the mechanism a little bit more and make sure we understand how this works. Next slide. So, oh, I see why I can do this. Here we go. So here's how it happens. When your arteries are healthy, they are constantly dilating and contracting in response.
response to what the body needs constantly back and forth. They're very elastic, they're very smooth, and they're able to do that easily. And part of the reason that they're so good at this is that the specialized cells on the inner lining of these arteries, these are called endothelial cells, and they produce nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. So it's a substance they produce that helps the artery open up, get bigger when it needs to. Now, every time a person eats a high-fat meal, that fat in little particles starts circulating throughout the bloodstream and it's digesting the meal. And when it encounters those endothelial cells, they become sticky. Then, white blood cells are also circulating in the bloodstream. They come along, they show up to try to clear out that fat and cholesterol. So remember learning about macrophages, the white blood cells that like gobble up other things that they need to get rid of. So they actually come along and eat up the fat and cholesterol. So now they're, they're, now they're called foam cells. Now they're these big, puffy, inflated white blood cells full of, of fatty stuff. And they stick to the sticky endothelial cells. Like I said, getting fat because you're eating the fat, and it forms this big globby mess. Next slide. So as more and more of the white blood cells gather, become filled with fat, they form a plaque. So the so picture, you know, the smooth lining of the artery. Now there's this little clump of fatty stuff and cells trying to clean up the fatty stuff. And they form this cap over the plaque. So lots of cells forming like this little wall over the fatty plaque. And then this is covered by a single layer of endothelial cells again, because the body's always trying to fix it. Well, now the vessel is not dilating well because those endothelial cells are just all gunked up. They're not able to produce the nitric oxide when they need to. So what happens if you have a tube that's basically a fixed size because it can't dilate and get bigger, but the pressure of the blood coming through there is sometimes increasing, sometimes staying the same, but the size can't you know, adjust to accommodate that. So the pressure really builds up in this area of the artery. And now you have this high pressure blood flowing through this narrow space with this icky, gunky cap of stuff in there. And it's more like a rupture. So that rupture, when it breaks off, this is a stroke. Question for you, do you think it's a more recently developed plaque or an older plaque that was formed years and years ago with, with last decade's fatty meals? Which one do you think it is that's more likely to break off and cause a problem? Recent. Yeah. Recent. Recent. You guys are good. It's a more recent one. Next slide. Yeah, you know, we think of um, we think of our, our poor choices over life as kind of accumulating and you know, oh well, I, I didn't know any better, I had a, a terrible diet back then, nothing I can do about it now. It's somewhat the opposite. So it's really our choices now that make the most impact for tomorrow, not our choices 10 years ago that make the impact for tomorrow. So again, I find a little bit of a message of hope in all this and, and how the body actually works and how these diseases happen. There is something that we can do about it. So to, like I said, I wasn't gonna go into specific studies because there's so many. I mean, the, the opposition to the, these basic concepts that you sometimes hear in popular media, no cholesterol doesn't cause strokes, give me a break. It's so well established. Please go hunt and find some studies. And just to give you an example, just this week, a new pretty large study came out of Sweden. So this had almost 32,000 women and they were um, living a low-risk lifestyle, which the study defined as a healthy diet using some sort of food store, um, moderate alcohol consumption, and if you look at 5 to 15 grams a day, that's a fairly small amount. Never smoking, they were physically active, which was defined as moving about 40 minutes a day, plus deliberate exercise at least one hour a week. And then they had a body mass index below 25, so that's the normal range. Under 25 is considered not overweight, normal. And their low risk lifestyle substantially reduced the risk of, risk of stroke in this study, especially cerebral infarctions where we have bits of brain death, very sad symptoms with those strokes. So, Significant because it's a pretty large study, and also because for once, 
they, they did a pretty good job of defining what this healthy lifestyle is. Sometimes you see research and it's pretty vague. What was their healthy diet? What was their exercise that was encouraged? This one's pretty clear. So again, kind of a message of hope here. Let's move on. So that was number two, the number one leading cause of death in the world, the number two leading cause of death in the world. And as we're already starting to see, these are very, very, very much related to what we eat. So I'm pleased that so many of you have heard of Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which is a nonprofit. And basically this group exists because these diseases are preventable. So cardiovascular disease, very cyclically becomes a hot topic in the media again. So it's been a few years, there's new popular diet books out trying to convince people that the facts aren't the facts, and it's time for another big academic conference in response to all the nonsense. So PCRM is putting on a cardiovascular disease specific conference uh, next summer, summer 2015 in Washington, DC. And I, I bring them up because, um, First of all, they're a nonprofit, which is encouraging because they don't have any vested interest in putting out any particular message. And their work is very much evidence-based. So, so the group, so many of you are familiar, I won't spend too much time, but they're primarily composed of physicians, other healthcare professionals, and concerned lay people who understand that we need to be doing something about all this disease being so preventable. So one of their resources that I want to make sure people are aware of is their online 21-day vegan kickstart. This is a free email-based program that will send you an email every day with lots of encouragement and recipes and blah, blah, blah. And it's very helpful for people who are aware that they need to do something about their health and kind of don't know where to start. This is a great free resource available to anyone with an email address. And then this logo, the power plate logo, is a pretty helpful thing as well because it's so simple and so visual. This is basically teaching us that food should look like the new four food groups of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Yes, grains. Yes, beans. <laughs> so, okay, go ahead. Who did this on? This was by the new one. Sorry? Who was this? Who, who? Does this, is it is it? Oh, so Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, they're a, a nationwide nonprofit at, based in Washington, D.C. And yeah, they run the, the free online 21 day kickstart, and then they um, came up with that logo, the power plate logo. Is, was that your question? Yeah, yeah. It was, okay. It was just nice to know that it, was, it wasn't somebody who was feeding, but, but rather a professional physician group. Yeah, exactly. They, I mean, they do, the, the organization does have some activity with um, trying to get animal testing out of medical research because it doesn't work or lead to accurate results. So, so you, I mean, you could say that they are in a way a vegan organization, but I definitely encourage you to look it up and decide for yourself if you think their approach is, is scientific and respectable. But, um, I do. <laughs> I just have been following their work for a really long time and found it to be the most reliable and evidence-based resource that was out there and free and accessible to everybody. So I actually became certified to teach their nutrition and cooking classes. That was on the title page where it said Food for Life Instructor under my name. That's a program that PCRM created that presents evidence-based health information along with cooking instruction to people so that they have the skills to be able to put things into practice. Yeah. What do you think about Dr. Elton's special change of thing about a no-fat diet and then the using like half the avocado three times a week is or yeah, not more than half an avocado in a single day. I think there's a there's a two part answer to that, and in general, the, the no oil recommendation is is pretty solid. Um, what is that before? I mean, would I go with that or would I go with half an avocado? So I I think the best general guideline is to completely avoid added oils, so like actual blood 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 oil from the bottle, but a high fat plant like an avocado is a whole food, is a nutritious food, and it's okay to have some of those monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats in our diet, but yes, I would be conscious of the total amounts. So I think for a person without any known disease, 
then something like a couple halves of an avocado a week is probably a reasonable level. I would not eat those high fat foods every day. I would definitely avoid the refined oils. And it took it took me a while personally to, to get on board with that recommendation as well. All oil is, is, is the same in this conversation, whether it's extra virgin coconut or olive or whatnot. Um, as you probably know, there's problems when heating a lot of oils with the, the lower smoke point ones. If you cook them above a certain temperature, you're actually creating a trans fat when it didn't start out that way. It's rancid. It's all very inflammatory. Let me briefly go over this excellent PCRM handout. They don't pay me to do this stuff. Um, of what happens when you eat a high fat meal. So, and this is all studies with, um, with sources at the bottom, so by all means, feel free to double check this. But when we eat a high fat meal, so whether it's, you know, whatever type of oil or a, a fatty hamburger, whatever it is, high fat, immediately the triglyceride levels in the blood increase, the cholesterol levels increase and contribute to these plaques in the arteries. And also clotting factors in the blood are activated, so you're more likely to form a clot. Two hours after a high fat meal, your triglycerides have increased by 60%. So when you have your blood draw, <laughs> and whether you've eaten recently makes a big difference in those numbers, but they go up quite a bit. And the blood flow, you can actually measure the rate of flow, decreases by half within two hours after a high fat meal. So that's a pretty significant difference. And then within three hours, the lining of the arteries, the endothelial cells that we were talking about, have lost a lot of their elasticity, so blood flow is cut down, and that makes the vessel function abnormal. It can't respond appropriately to changes. Within four hours, the blood is measurably thicker, so it flows even slower than the two hours ago. Within five hours of a high fat meal, the triglyceride levels have now increased by 150%. And within six hours after the high fat meal, the anti-inflammatory effect of the good cholesterol, the HDL, is actually very compromised. So yes, having proportionally higher HDL is a positive thing, but it can't do its job when the total circulating fat is too high. Did they say that coconut oil was great for you? I'm sorry, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's talking about Bernard also. Yeah, Bernard, Esselstyn, Ornish, yeah. And there's, and again, you're happy, you're welcome okay. to write these down and check them out for yourself. Yeah. But there's lots of accumulating um, evidence that, that basically we don't need the added fats. We're getting all the fat we need in what's already present in the foods. So again, with the, uh, the power plate logo, if that's a, a simple, easy way for you to remember what real food is, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, all of those contain small amounts of fat. If you're eating real food, you're getting small amounts of fat in all those foods on a regular basis, and it adds up to plenty. We don't actually need to add any whatsoever. And then when we add the oils, the highly refined and concentrated sources of fat, it creates all these problems. And we can actually directly measure the blood flow with the brachial artery test and, and see that happening <coughs> after just one high fat meal. He was first, yes? I, um, yeah, I agree we can get most of our fats from the food. The one question I have, just a practical one in terms of cooking, how about those little spray things that just do there's, tiny amount of you, you're right, it's a teeny tiny amount, and if, you know, if your heart is set on making something where for your cooking technique you absolutely need to do it, then by all means use a spray rather than pouring it on. Okay. Um, but, you know, the, the lowest, the, as low as you can take your, your added oil, the better. Absolutely. So in the, in the Food for Life classes, and there are other similar programs, I'm not trying to plug just one, but where you can find somebody to, to teach you some no oil vegan cooking skills, we, we do a lot with that, teaching you how to you know, saute onions without <coughs> using oil. And there are, there are basically a few tricks to learn. And once you've learned those tricks in the kitchen, it is really possible to cook just about anything with no oil at all. Or sometimes, like you said, just a teeny, teeny amount in the form of a spray so it doesn't stick to something. But it is possible and the food tastes good. Please trust me. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, I was wondering, I know that there's a lot of these recipes and guidelines, but what does PCRM or you recommend in terms of like <coughs> workflow, in terms of getting food available relatively easy in your home? So you mean to make the transition to eating low fat plant based? Or? Yeah, like, like, like there it is, it's three o'clock and you're thinking about dinner but you may not have the ingredients for the recipe you're thinking of. I mean, what kind of workflow do, do they recommend? Okay, yeah, so that's another area where it really helps, if at all possible, to have somebody very experienced come and help you and actually set up your kitchen and do some you know, grocery shopping and stocking of the basics so that you have some good backup plans. Um, just to give a few basic examples, I definitely recommend having frozen fruit and vegetables in the freezer at all times. It's really easy to take out a bag of frozen veggies and do a quick stir fry. Have cans of beans. You can pop a can, rinse them, throw them in with some veggies and have a great meal. And then batch cooking is really helpful. If you make up a big bean soup or a big chili or a big veggie soup in a large quantity and then freeze part of it so you have that for later in the week, that's very helpful. Things that are watery, freeze well, and reheat well, like soups. Um, and then just, you know, being well stocked with your plain whole grains, plain beans, preferably dried if you cook them dry, soak and cook them, um, but canned is okay too if that's how you're gonna eat them. So I think it's a matter of, of really setting yourself up for success. Um, some people use the phrase sanitizing the kitchen, so, so get rid of all the processed junk, just don't even have it there, so that when it's three and your lunch wasn't good and you're starving and you have to eat something right away, it's not there, you can't grab it. So, so I really recommend putting some thought into it ahead of time and making sure that you're stocked and set up for success. And frozen produce is the next best thing to fresh. If you're not gonna get fresh all the time, Frozen is your is your next best choice. Yeah. yeah. Why then avocado? And avocado is good fat. It is good fat, but the thing is, we don't need as much as we think we do. So it's okay to eat it once in a while, but I would certainly not eat it every day. But for someone who wants to put on weight, they could do that, right? So you're right that it's a good dense source of calories for maintaining weight. The problem is all these things that we've been talking about still happen. So, you know, your arteries don't know if you're a normal weight person, an underweight person, or an overweight person. They just know that that fat is there circulating and the white blood cells respond to it and the whole cascade happens. I mean, thin people have heart attacks and strokes. Sad but true. <laughs> Sorry, real quick. What percentage of fat do you recommend, like, 10% of your body weight, what is the number? So the, the beauty in this way of eating is that you actually don't have to worry about the numbers. Um, it, it turns out to about 10% of calories from fat when you're eating a whole food, plant-based diet. So we're talking about no dairy, no animal products, no eggs. And if we're eating primarily not processed foods, but real fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, that naturally works itself out to be about 10% of calories from fat, and almost all of it is the unsaturated fats. So fortunately, you really don't have to do any math and do any detailed planning. It really does sort itself out, which is a huge relief. Um, we're, we're not gonna go too much into detail on diabetes, but when I'm teaching people about diabetes, this is a really important concept because People who are trying to follow a diabetic diet are really, really counting carbohydrates, counting sugars, and counting calories, and it's such a huge relief when people who are accustomed to doing that learn to simply eat a whole foods plant-based diet because it takes a, it really does take away the need for that. They, they don't have to, to do the math and do the counting and weighing and measuring anymore. It really does take care of itself. Let me do one more question and then I'll move on. Yeah, thank you for me, Carrie. Um, I don't eat any oil except mm -hmm. ingesting various amounts of flax seeds. Mm -hmm. Flax seeds, anywhere from half a teaspoon to two tablespoons. So that's a whole food. That's not an oil. Well, but I'm still looking at oil consumption. So what would um, your guys, Bernard and the Cleveland guy, what can you say for flax seeds? How much you get? Well, the studies that I've, my brain always goes back to what, what have I actually seen in a good published study. And what I've seen is usually in the ballpark of two tablespoons a day. Yeah, that's what I've heard too. Yeah. Um, Dr. Forrester was saying you only really need a half a teaspoon. And that, that makes sense to 
me as well. You know, if you're eating a really good diet, you're getting lots of fiber. Some people focus on the ground flax for the fiber as well as the good fats. So, again, there are small amounts of fats in every whole food, and it really does add up to a knot. So, I would say, please don't worry about it as much as you are worrying about it. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's move on, and we'll try to have more time for questions at the end. But number three, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't look at the back one. Oh, okay. sure. So number three cause of death in the world is chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. So this would primarily include <coughs> emphysema and asthma. So emphysema, undeniable number one cause is smoking. It's pretty easy to cut back on the number of emphysema deaths if you can theoretically get everybody to stop smoking. And then both of these, let me look my studies I wanted to talk about, are also related to diet, which may be a little bit surprising. But there are some decent studies showing that increasing fruits and vegetables in people who already have emphysema and asthma results in better outcomes, fewer symptoms. So it's, you know, it's not a huge body of research, but it only makes sense. If your body is dealing with some sort of disease process, you need better nutrition, you need better resources available in your body to deal with that. So there is somewhat of a dietary link with these as well. There was one um, hilarious study that I have to mention where some researchers were looking at adding high antioxidant foods for emphysema patients, and what they did was they took the powder of acai berries, which is of course very, very high in antioxidant content, they added that to cigarettes <laughs> and forced mice to smoke them. <laughs> Possibly your tax dollars at work. So the moral is don't smoke. If you have rescued mice, don't force them to smoke. And I don't care whether there's acai powder in it or not, but please do eat the antioxidant-rich foods. Also some really good studies that higher fruit and veggie intake in children and adults with asthma can, can dramatically help them. So of course, as far as the cause of these diseases, it's complex. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that by changing your diet you could totally prevent or cure these, but food definitely does play a role and can definitely help mitigate the damage. Okay, next slide. I'm going to drink a water while you look at this. So the, so the blue, or it looks green here, is 2012 data compared to the pink, which is data from year 2000. So you can look at how these um, causes of death have changed a little bit, even just over about a decade. So this is the same um, source as one of the earlier graphics I showed from the World Health Organization. You can find this information on their website. And what you notice, of course, is that the top three, everything has, has stayed the same or increased within those categories. So the top two are the ones that are very, very, very clearly related to what we eat. So basically heart attacks and strokes are getting worse rather than getting better over the last decade, worldwide. Worldwide. Not just in developed nations. Sad stuff. Lower respiratory issues have improved slightly. The next one, remember, is cancers. So trachea, bronchus, lung cancers are on the rise. HIV AIDS has, has decreased slightly. Diarrheal diseases, infective so an infectious process, those have, have decreased a bit with better sanitation and education, presumably. Diabetes is on the rise, proportionally big time. And hypertensive on the rise, and then things like uh, pregnancy issues and tuberculosis declining. So the overall pattern here is what? Which types of diseases are actually getting worse? Food-related diseases. This is sad, we should do better. Next slide. So that was the world, world data, top three in the world. This is the US. So this is pretty, pretty similar. Number one is heart disease. Number three is some of the same COPD stuff we talked about. Stroke is right there, close behind at number four. And Alzheimer's has made the list for the first time. Also diet related. 
please check out Power Foods for the Brain, book title by Dr. Neil Bernard, which does an excellent job of explaining how degenerative brain diseases are linked to food choices. And diabetes has, has made the, the top ones again. Um, kidney nephritis, nephritic syndrome, this is all kidney stuff, which is predominantly related to diabetes. Um, I'm sad to say that suicide makes the list in the United States. And then the one I skipped over, weighing in at number two, whereas it barely made the list worldwide, is cancer. Why are we so good at getting cancer here? Uh, also, food related. Um, Let's see. So, isn't modern high tech medicine supposed to be really good at helping us with cancer? Supposed to. Supposed to. Not, not helping much, unfortunately. Yeah. Isn't cancer so high in the United States because there's so many toxins here, including in the water supply and everything? Well, you, they certainly play a role. They certainly play a role in the process, probably in the initiation part. So, you know, in cancer, it's abnormal, uncontrolled growth of cells, and something has to start that. So in the process of cancer, we have initiation and promotion and then metastases spread. So initiation is whatever happens to damage the DNA, mutate the DNA in the first place. And that is often environmental contaminants. The thing is, though, that there are terrible environmental contaminants in many, many, many places in the world. So why aren't those promoting, growing, metastasizing? Because they're as bad as the United States? Oh, okay. I, couldn't, I couldn't give you literal data, but it, but it has to be. I mean, think about all the, all the regulations on everything that we have here and in other developed places and how terribly, terribly polluted so many third world countries are. They do not have the cancer incidents that we do. So, so think about this. This process of initiating cancer is happening constantly. We are being bombarded with things that mutate our DNA constantly. But this is where our functioning immune systems come into play and can actually snuff out the bad cells or repair the DNA mutations before they have a chance to, to grow and, and actually become a full-blown <laughs> cancer. So it's, there's a complex interplay of all kinds of things going on here, all kinds of factors influencing the immune system, and we have enormous bodies of data showing that food intake makes a huge difference in the development of the cancers. So everybody admits now that meat eating is very, very strongly correlated with lots of different types of cancers. Sometimes you'll still hear it expressed as just processed meats, but there's lots of data on all meat being linked to cancer. Even the, uh, this is a lovely tidbit from a Gregor video, which I wish I could reproduce for you with his humor, but even the meat industry has in their journal, Meat Science, I believe, um, made several statements that if we were only going by the science, everyone would be a vegetarian as far as promoting, uh, sorry, as far as preventing cancer. So if even the meat industry will acknowledge that there is this enormous body of data, you know it's there because they're really good at denying that it's there. So, so again, by all means, please look it up. Don't take my word for it. Find these resources on your own. Um, but undeniable links with meat and cancer also with dairy, um, I teach an entire you know month-long series on this, so I'll try not to blabber about it too long right now, so we can get to other things. But um, dairy is very, very, very strongly correlated, in particular with prostate cancer in men. And there have been some pretty powerful study designs where if you take a person's blood, spin the cells out, so you just have their serum in a petri dish, and you add cancer cells to that. The serum from people consuming dairy is just like fertilizer on these cancer cells, and they just grow like crazy. And then serum from people not having any dairy, um, the, the cells either don't grow at all or it's at a much slower rate. So several studies with that design. Okay, let's move on because I can spend way too much time on cancer. And... Next slide. So 
Uh, so number three in the U.S. then was the chronic lower respiratory diseases. So we talked a little bit about asthma, um, which is included in this, as well as COPD, emphysema. So smoking is responsible for about 80% of these diagnoses. So again, if you're eating your wonderful, clean, low-fat, plant-based diet, but you're also smoking, then we still need to talk. Please stop smoking. Um, now, one of the risk factors for all the chronic lower respiratory diseases is actually overweight. So you may not think that those would be strongly correlated, but overweight does come up as an independent risk factor for respiratory diseases as well. And once again, it actually does help to clean up your diet. So <coughs> one good study found that just a single serving of fruit decreases overall COPD risk, so risk of developing the disease, by 24%. So this is in you know, people who have not yet been diagnosed, but if you look at their diet and a group of people over time, even um, a single serving of fruit difference between the groups decreases risk by almost a quarter, a huge amount. And then there are lots of other good studies where as fruit and vegetable intake goes up, the risk goes down. Black tea makes the risk go down. Soy makes the risk go down. Fiber from whole grains makes the risk go down. And pure meat makes it go up. Very similar to um, other disease processes here. And just a different way of kind of saying the same thing, some studies have shown that in people who already had lung disorders, <coughs> Adding fruits and vegetables to their diet improved their lung function. So that's important, how well they could breathe. Oh, thank you. I have to go really fast. Okay, next slide. <laughs> so this is cancer incidence worldwide. Look at the pink countries. I just thought this was another helpful visual because what are they? They're the developed countries, the rich nations. Lots and lots of cancer. Next slide. Um, I'm sorry this did not come out more clearly. But you may have seen this in other talks. This is the association between calcium from animal sources. And it does make a huge difference if you're talking about calcium total or looking at plant sources versus animal sources. The more calcium we take in from animal sources, the more prostate cancer. Not good. Next slide. Um, so Dr. Gregor and I call our talks more than an apple because we're, what's the more than part? And to, and to me, this, this means a couple of different things. So of course, there's the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, and we're talking about prevention with that saying. But what is prevention exactly? And I think this is you know, an ongoing question. How do we really define the perfectly healthy lifestyle? Um, and it's controversial, and it's constantly being refined, such as with the questions with the oils and fats, which is a hot topic. There's all this nonsense now about all grains being bad for you, which is a hot topic. And what I wanted to do is um, talk about some of these terms that people are constantly confused by when we're talking about healthy diets and lifestyles, but maybe I can skip over that. Is anybody not clear and comfortable with the difference between vegetarian, vegan, plant-based, whole foods? Anybody? Don't be shy. Do you need help with some of those definitions? Plant-based versus vegan. Thank you. Good question. Plant-based versus vegan. So vegan basically encompasses more in general use. It means a diet completely free of animal products. But most people who would say, I am vegan, are also talking about avoiding leather, avoiding um, shellfish, avoiding gelatin in their pills, all, all these other things as well. I think within a health context, plant-based is still in the process of being clearly defined, and most of the time it means a diet completely free of animal products, so a vegan diet. We're just talking about food. Where I'm concerned, though, is I have personally heard several people say, oh, I'm plant-based, and they're some of the biggest meat eaters I know. <laughs> so I think, and, and we know across many, many, many types of research, we know that people over-report their vegetable and fruit intake. Everybody remembers that day they ate a salad and felt good about themselves and were sad and everything. So that you know, great, but but I think we're we're still in the process of refining in common language what plant-based means and what it is supposed to mean, what it should mean in a health context, is a whole foods vegan diet, because that's what 
consistently is shown to be the most health-promoting diet in the world, no matter what type of research you're looking at. Okay, and any other burning questions on lingo? Okay. So let me just rant for a quick moment again about the idea of essentially quality of life, the disability stuff, in addition to looking at causes of disease, looking at causes of disability. I think it's important to know what we're suffering from while we're alive, so that we can understand that and figure out how to do something about it and live better lives. So just think about this for a moment. If, if I live my entire life feeling pretty good, I have good mobility, I'm free of pain, I'm able to feel like I'm pretty mentally sharp and engaged in the world around me and engaged with other people, and I find meaningful connections, with what I'm doing and with my loved ones and my community, and I never feel that I've become a burden for someone else to bear. And if on the day that my time is eventually up, I experience minimal pain and suffering or even none at all, that's a pretty ideal situation. I mean, can you imagine, what, what, what could one hope for other than that? So you might even say that that's too good to be true or unrealistic, but I think that it could be realistic. I'm, I'm concerned that we hear so few stories about people just dying peacefully in their sleep anymore, and we hear so many stories about all of this stuff. So, you know, I don't really know or care which category of all this might finish me off, but I know that I'm putting forth what I consider to be a pretty reasonable amount of effort. I mean, I think the, the measures that I've put into place to live a healthier life are pretty doable. They're, they're, this is no great daily uphill battle. This is just eating good food, you know, and moving because it feels good to move, not because somebody's behind me with a cattle prod, you know? So I think this is a reasonable thing to ask of people. Um, and I, I'm upset about this in cooking classes. You know, I see people repeatedly over several weeks and get to know them a little bit, and they, they talk about their lives and they're going through habit changes. And one thing that constantly comes up is, you know, not just that people's weight is going down, their cholesterol is going down, they have more energy and they feel good. We, we expect that. We, we know that's going to happen. But people like to talk about that they're in a better mood and that they're less angry and they're less reactive. Um, one person admitted to being a bit of a road rager and admitted that they just didn't have that flash of anger anymore after somebody cut them off or whatnot. That is amazing to me, that that could be related to your food. Because again, <laughs> we're not even doing you know, an exercise intervention necessarily. People feel better, so they want to exercise more. And they have better endurance and maintain their fitness better when, they're, when their diet is a lot better. But I just think that's amazing that, that I'm not putting that idea in their heads. They're coming to me and reporting that over and over and over again. So there's got to be something there. Who, know, who knows how powerful this could be for mental health as well. And then lower back pain, um, guess what I'm going to say? It's also diet related. <laughs> and again, Gregor has some really good info on this. Um, lower back pain is very much related to kidneys and hydration a lot of times, but also the, um, it's also an atherosclerosis process. So the blood supply to the lower back is also a very significant issue with back pain. Next slide. This is a picture, and I stole this from a regular video. Of, um, on the left, this is what a normal um, vertebral disc, artery, this is the artery. This is what this normally looks like, and you can see the openings where the, um, the vessels go through to the discs, to the discs. And then, I guess it got cut off when I went into the presentation book, but you can just see a little bit over here. These are these same openings where the vessels should be able to go through, and they're narrowed. They can't do that. So it only makes sense. Not enough blood flow to the vertebral discs in the spine is going to somehow relate in pain. And I'm not an expert in that, but again, yes, it's related to the food, and specifically the fat. Slide. So again, just one more way to look at what are these problems we have in our country is to look at the drugs that are being prescribed. This is within the United States. So staggering numbers of drugs. Um, a large percent of them is generic. 
a percentage of visits to a doctor that result in a prescription is over 75%. So imagine you go back to your doctor three or four times working on the same issue, and maybe three of those four times you're coming away with a prescription. Whoa, there's so much we could do with lifestyle, as we've just seen, and we're still so, so, so dependent on drugs, so that's scary to me. And then the most frequently prescribed types of drugs um, are pain relief, analgesics, antihyperlipidemic agents, so cholesterol-lowering drugs, because so, so, so many of us have high cholesterol, and then antidepressants. Something like, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact stat, something like 25 or 30 percent of American women are on antidepressants. Mm -hmm. Whoa, not good. Because of course they all have side effects from drug interactions and cause us problems and it's just a mess. So again, you can find this at the CDC, and there's also a, another report at WebMD, if you don't believe me. Next slide. So, a quote to kind of try to sum up some of this. If people just did four simple things, and again, they're really not that hard. Don't smoke. Get some exercise every day. Make your diet based on whole plant foods. And don't become obese, which is easy to do if you're not doing these other things. You, we could prevent most cases of diabetes, heart attacks, half of strokes, and a third of cancers. And I think these were based actually on fairly conservative estimates. It may even be, be more optimistic than that. So another way of saying the same thing, even modest changes may be more effective in reducing cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, heart failure, stroke, cancer, diabetes, and all-cause mortality than almost any other medical intervention. And once again, I want to point out the difference here. If we're looking at all-cause mortality, if we're saying that changing people's lives, how they live their lives, can dramatically change how they die, what about all those years that they're living? Aren't they going to be living better all those years? Are we going to have fewer people where their last couple of decades are very, very uncomfortable and expensive and miserable? Next slide. So, how, am I over on time? It's okay. Yes? Okay. Well, yell at me when I really need to quit because I have a little more to say. So, so the simplest answer to the, the horribly difficult, confusing, burning question of what does an ideal diet actually look like is to eat your diet based on whole foods. They should be low in fat. They should be based on plants. They should not have added oils. Now, with each individual person, it requires a more detailed conversation than that. If it were that easy, we would all just do it. Done. Problem solved. It, it's hard because it's emotional, it's personal, it's cultural. We experience cravings, we experience addictions. So it's okay to need some more personalized help. And some of the best resources that you, if you need to delve in a little bit deeper, I've talked about PCRM, I've talked about all these important doctors. Um, True North is a health center in Santa Rosa that puts a lot of this into practice. One I haven't mentioned is the Wellness Forum. This is an organization based out of Columbus, Ohio, run by Dr. Pam Hopper. Does anybody know that name? Yeah. So she, some people recognize the name because she was um, interviewed a little bit in Forks Over Knives. But she's been doing um, healthy lifestyle disease reversal types of work for about 30 years. And she's just amazingly talented at, again, translating difficult research and also difficult healthcare decisions. So what screening do I get? What you know? What do I actually do to treat this diagnosis? So how do we Google it and find it? It's Wellness Forum. Yeah, just just look up Wellness Forum. In Ohio, Pam Popper, P O P P E R. So what I'm getting at is she has um, like a, a concierge medical service. You can hire her to be your helper. She's a naturopathic physician and a PhD in nutrition, but she is not an MD, so she can't technically do everything drug-related, but she's so good at looking at all the data and helping you make your own decisions to be your own advocate. So she also has um, like a membership-based organization where you get access to lots of good detailed healthy eating information. Um, lots and lots of information. Check it out. Next slide. I'm Carrie Zemko. Oh, Pam Popper. P O P P E R. And then some of these are free. These are online resources. The, the Physicians Committee 21 Day Vegan Kickstarter I mentioned. McDougal has a 10 day kind of 
kind of self-guided program where it's all outlined for you on his website for free. His is drmcdougall.com. Forks Over Knives has a similar thing. It's a little bit more loose. It's a little bit just like, here's some recipes, yay. And then Colleen Patrick Boudreau does a 30-day vegan challenge. I don't know the details of hers, but that's the price point. And then um, Linda Middlesworth, who's a, a longtime Food for Life instructor like I am, she's based out of Sacramento, and offers an email-based program where basically she's reviewing your food journal for a month. So, you know, a lot of people just need that process of, of writing it down and checking in with someone and having some help with being accountable for what you're doing. So that's kind of the basis of her program. She has a, a very firm two-strike policy. Like, if you're not serious about doing totally plant-based, no oil, and following the guidelines, if, if you have two days where you really mess up, then done. You're done. You can start over the next month if you want to, but, you know, this is for people who are serious about making so then I thought, okay, I'm going to offer the same thing, but see if I can, you know, be, be a little bit more helpful to get you through those days than just to stretch you out. So, so I'll do the same thing. We can talk. It's, it's new to me. I don't have a lot of structure, but basically I want to just offer, if somebody just needs an email check-in, I'll, I'll send you the resources that are good for you and see what I can do with helping with those cooking questions and food choice tweaking questions. So call it about $25 for a month, and I am going to require that people read one of the several helpful books, your choice of several that I recommend. Next slide. So you know what? I'm going to skip the game. I'm sorry, because I'm over on time. But I thought it would be really fun to talk about harmful terms and concepts such as natural, <laughs> such as everything in moderation, things like that. But we'll save that for another time. Um, that's about it. I have lots of other books and resources, which I'd be, be happy to share titles. And I'm happy to stick around and answer some questions. But I should respect the space and, and move on out of here. So thank you so much.